Yeah. All right, there's a bunch of seats up front that I happen to notice. And so if nobody moves from the back row up to the front row, I'm going to be forced to yell into the microphone, which might just be unpleasant for everyone. Any takers? Back row? Second to last row? Uh, this stock is going to be entertaining no matter what. So, uh, oh, that's good. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, okay, well, I think we'll just jump into it, and anyone that comes late is going to miss the awesome intro. So thank you for um, uh, coming to Mo Servers, Mo Problems. My name is Nick Stilau. I work at Pantheon, uh, and I firmly believe that uh, uh, the more servers you have, the more problems you have. And I'm going to try to convince you of that. Uh, and um, uh, talk a little bit about um, some alternatives and Linux containers and uh, what they can do for you. So really this talk is about um, uh, containers versus VMs, but we're not going to worry about that too much right now. Uh, I'll convince you of that in a little bit. So we're just going to start off with kind of what kind of problems am I, am I talking about? They're not kind of these like existential worries, you know, kind of out there. I'm talking about uh, real problems that, um, that are a pain for site owners, I'm talking about downtime, and I'm particularly talking about problems for uh, kind of operators, systems administrators, the people who might be getting alerts uh, from such things as Pingdom, PagerDuty, Desk.com, New Relic, you name it. Um, problems that are waking you up at night, bothering you on the weekends, uh, and not keeping the beautiful sites that people are, are creating online. So really, this talk is going to be about how using containers instead of VMs can increase your uptime and decrease, uh, decrease the number of problems you encounter, specifically those problems that encounter human interaction, which are a special kind of annoying problem, which I'll get into um, shortly. I don't think I don't see Mark, but he wanted me to talk about the shadow cloud in this talk, and this was this is about as close as it's going to get. There's the clouds, and there were shadows under it, but um, I had to crop them out to make it pretty. So uh, <laughs> we can save shadow shadow cloud for Q and A. Uh, and want to remind us that um, we are living in the future, and. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. You know, cloud's been around for a while. Containers, like, kind of big buzzword. Um, and I want to convince you guys that this is something, like, we should all learn more about and figure out how it can, like, serve, serve ourselves and the people we work with and the site owners and, and everyone around us. Um, and then, lastly, I'll promise that um, we will get our hands a little bit dirty, uh, dirty in this talk, digging into some of uh, some kind of C-group stuff, lower level. So... Um, Let's see, who's like a sysadmin or like an operator or like a cloud person? Awesome. Maybe half, maybe more. Who's not? Are you got, what are you guys? Developer. Cool. Yeah. So a lot of this is like on both sides of the fence. Sysadmins or whoever operators are often the ones dealing with this, but developers are often the ones that have the great ideas and just can't get it deployed out. So um, this should be some like good background of what's going on. Okay, so up, for, uh, up first, uh, I'm going to uh, really try my hardest to convince you guys that the um, uh, more servers you have, the more problems you have. A lot of people, you know, you kind of like get that nice new quad core or whatever, and it like seems like this awesome thing, but um, maybe by the end of this presentation, you'll, uh, you'll kind of, um, you know, not be so excited the next time you get budget to buy some servers. So on a high level, most of the people in this room, uh, like, probably make money by managing sites. That's kind of everyone who's operating, keeping the stuff online, that sort of thing. Um, and so kind of graph this out with kind of a fake graph, show some trends. You know, if you're not managing any sites, you just have one problem, which is that nobody's paying you any money. So uh, you want to get rid of that. And then you start managing some sites and you get some problems. And you start managing some more sites and you get some more problems. Um, and, you know, uh, the more, like, sites... Um, Keeping sites online isn't easy. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, there's about a million things that can go wrong, even with a single Drupal site, right? The weirdest things can take stuff down. 
So, uh, you know, you can't get rid of your plums entirely, but what you can do is kind of think about kind of uh, methodologies and technologies and stuff like that that can let you grow the number of sites that you manage while having fewer problems. And I think, you know, there's no numbers on these access axes, and I think it is relevant that, you know, certainly at, at scale, um, this becomes important, but I, but I would argue that, uh, and will argue that, even at a small scale of one server, a few servers, all this, all this stuff is equally applicable. Um, uh, and we want to be thinking about um, what happens when we start managing more sites. So the, the first thing I'm going <laughs> to, the first way I'm going to try to persuade you is uh, to tell you a little bit of story. And this story is um, over the, took place over the past couple of years at Pantheon, uh, where we um, have firsthand knowledge of kind of trying kind of a VM first, uh, like a like a VM-based architecture, and then kind of a new multi-tenant containerized architecture, um, and, uh, and and where that's led us. So these guys, couple uh, these guys, you know, have launched a lot of Drupal sites, like many people in this room, hundreds, right? Done the same thing over and over again, and yet still kind of. Still kind of we see sites failing, going off, that kind of thing. So around maybe late 2010, these guys had an idea, you know, let's get all this stuff that people, are, you know, love. Get the whole kind of LAMP stack going, get kind of Redis or Memcache in there, get some Jenkins to like run some jobs on the side, that sort of thing. Give it a little dashboard so you can click around and it's pretty. Slap it on a VM and charge lots of money and get super rich. Um, and well, except for that last part, uh, we did it. We got 300 clients. We got uh, one, one client for, per VM, so we had about 300 virtual machines. These were all in rack space, and we had 300 problems. This was a nightmare to support. This was like uh, doing OS upgrades were the worst, like dealing with rack space, like dealing with individual outages with rack space, trying to communicate status to like customers when you know, you're just pagers going off and that kind of stuff. Having dev influence live, all these things. So. We learned firsthand that that wasn't that great idea and sat down to noodle it over a little bit and had this awesome idea where, okay, let's take 300 uh, like one gig VMs, kind of do some platform magic and uh, turn it into maybe like 10, 30 gig VMs. The way kind of some of these cloud things works that actually cost the same um, uh, if, the, if the pricing is linear on RAM and uh, we just need to kind of make this magic happen. So we kind of were figuring out what that magic was. And so we got these kind of bigger servers, uh, multi-tenant, kind of containerized with Solar on some and PHP on the others and Redis on the others and MariaDB on the others. Uh, and at the time, it was MySQL. Um, and so we were kind of figuring out this out, and it was, it was going pretty well. So kind of just like thinking about this talk and thinking about this like made-up graph that I made, um, and I was thinking like, okay, let's do some math because I went to school and I did math in school, and that's cool. So I'm like, okay, well, what, when do I get more problems? And I'm like, okay, so I, like, it, it, it correlates. I'm going to do a linear correlation just to you know, keep it easy. It correlates with the number of sites, uh, but there seems to be this like, rate of growth that I, I just coined the uh, term, the, the PETA coefficient. So this is the pain in, pain in the ass coefficient, but um, it can also be represented by a stack of PETAs, or um, I chose Omicron because nothing out there uses Omicron to denote it. And then I realized why, because that just looks like zero and it makes all your equations kind of confusing. But rest assured, that is the PETA coefficient, which is the uh, problems per month uh, that any one thing gives you. So it's nice and abstract, um, which means I th maybe that means it can't be wrong. Um, so yeah, let's all just take take this for <laughs> let's all just take this for for fact, PETA coefficient. So it's like writing some numbers uh, for Pantheon, and <laughs> so I'm like, okay, like how many problems a month? So I looked at like all those services I mentioned earlier, like Desk.com tickets, Pingdom alerts, PagerDuty alerts, like all these kind of like automated systems and and actually interacting with customers and humans and stuff, and trying to figure out kind of exactly how much of a pain like these different things represent and so came out with like vm you know like per server a servers are like way bigger a pain than anything else per kind of active drupal developer who's banging on stuff per drupal user who's logging in and running crazy admin queries and stuff per container per page view and so like oh that's pretty clever i kind of proved like i proved my point how clever um but if anybody actually knows math uh, or is just paying attention, that's kind of like tautologically true what I just like did there because I don't have that many servers relative to users, so of course they're going to represent 
more problems. So thinking about it a little bit more, uh, so risk, um, you know, kind of can be defined as kind of the probability or likelihood of something happening times the impact or consequence of that thing. So if we're kind of talking about VMs and containers here, you can kind of look at, okay, what if we have two containers on one VM, right? We have half as many things that can break, so maybe that's half as much likelihood, but then if something does break, say the disk, we have double the consequences. Um, and then conversely, if we had two VMs, right, risk, you might have twice as, twice as many disks, things that can break, one half the consequences because only one site would be down or something like that. So I haven't really, like, so, like, according to kind of this math, like, there's no, um, there's no real difference between these two. Um, so let's think about it a little bit more. So think about kind of the problems, like, you see when you're on a call, right, so, or dealing with servers. Some things like are kind of like self-healing problems. And these, of course, are my favorite kind of problems because you kind of just like, you know, wake up in the morning and there might be like an alert in your inbox or um, you might kind of see like a minute of downtime if there was some kind of flakiness or something. But you didn't have to wake up. You didn't have to like make any decisions, that kind of stuff. And then we start talking about problems that require some manual intervention, right? So this might be basic button pushing where you kind of have to go on, click a button, you know, and that'll resolve the issue. Um, then kind of maybe some real decisions have to be made. Sometimes you even find, um, find issues that require coding to solve or may, maybe like hard business, uh, business decision trade-offs. Um, uh, you know, whether you should kind of, um, like data integrity versus availability, maybe like that, right? And if you're making those decisions on the fly, you're uh, making human decisions, and the more, under more stress and more time constraint and stuff that you are, you're going to be making probably, on average, worse and worse decisions. And so if we go back to kind of the simple equation of risk equals likelihood, likelihood times consequence, that really doesn't take into effect human, uh, human decisions and human interactions during that process. Um, because each decision and each trade-off you're evaluating, especially when it's kind of on the fly and you're trying to get the server up and like figure out what is going on with like the disk or the network or whatever, swap, you know, any of these million things, the more likely you are to actually incur additional risks and make additional problems for yourself. Um, so I think in, in that sense, um, uh, going back to kind of the, these, these two equations, um, if, if any of the consequences... Um, uh, involve human decisions, they, um, they are actually, uh, they can have bigger consequences than they look like. And so in that sense, kind of rolling with, with containers um, uh, um, makes you make fewer of those hard human decisions, uh, which means you're introducing few, fewer kind of human, um, uh, human error and uh, under the gun decisions. So another thing we can talk about is like uh, network failure paths, right? So each server you like bring online, if you're kind of in a cluster, that server needs to talk to every other server. Uh, maybe you're on, um, you know, it depends on your infrastructure. You might have like an internal private network and you might have a public network, right? Which compounds things even further because both of those things can like fail separately. Maybe you're on hardware, maybe you're not, but um, maybe you're on, uh, on the cloud. But uh, in this case, um, because of that kind of O of N squared, um, uh, growth of, of edges in a complete graph. Uh, if we go from five to six servers, we actually, we got one more server, but we got five more problems, five more network paths that can break and, uh, be not, uh, and um, prevent your site from being online or your data from being backed up or um, uh, replicated or any of those things. Um, and like largely, like the network, like the network works most of the time, right? So, um, there's this great blog post by Afir called The Network is Reliable, and this thing kind of goes into um, case studies from um, many different data center providers showing that the, the network is indeed not reliable. And it might be re reliable if you have a few VMs, like over some time, but if you look at any um, uh, enterprise-grade data center um, on, on down to anything else, uh, there are, like network partitions are a very real thing that happen, um, and... Uh, and, and so it, this, it makes this problem definitely a real thing, that adding one server adds you a bunch more than one uh, network, network pass that could fail and probably will fail at some, some point. So if you want fewer problems, um, <laughs> there's uh, a couple of different things you can do. Some people who are more like um, OPSI might kind of might know these terms, which are... Um, which are pretty uh, common, mean time between failure and um, uh, mean time to resolution. 
So if you want fewer, fewer problems, there's, uh, I was thinking of some different ways you can do that, right? You can get more reliable things, right? Maybe we're talking about disks, maybe we're talking about network, maybe we're talking about um, any of those things. And that one's kind of a toughie. I mean, you could, probably, you could probably pay more, maybe, and get more reliable stuff, but really, I'm gonna let the network guy do the network and the disk manufacturers do the disk stuff. And the real thing that I can control is to get fewer things. Get fewer, server, get fewer servers specifically. Uh, and then of course you wanna um, decrease the time to resolution. So you can speed up detection, insight, resolution. Some of the other great DevOps talks um, are gonna touch on some of this stuff for automated monitoring and telling when stuff is wrong and when performance does, um, does spike up, kind of trying to figure out what's going on, get that site back online quick. Um, and then lastly, as we were just talking about, reduce the reliance on human decisions. Um, uh, again, human decisions are going to compound risk and introduce additional risks when you're just trying to fix something in the first place. Which brings me to Chief Chirpa. So Chief Chirpa was, um, well, he was the um, leader of the, of the Ewoks on the forest moon Endor, but also he was the first, it was the name of the first like, server I worked on and deployed code to out of college, or I was in college. And I love Chief Chirpa, um, and, and uh, you know, he's a great server. I'd push up my code. I, I kind of felt like he was a, my, like one of my friends sometimes, but, but in the end, Chief Chirpa burned me, and so that was kind of one of the, like one of the few of a long, long road of lessons that um, now I can say Chief Chirpa sucks and would rather, uh, you know, drink, drink beer with my friends and hang out with my real human friends and treat my servers like stuff like endpoint 9A71A. 1EF, um, and uh, so hopefully I, I convinced convince you a little bit that um, uh, servers um, can power the internet, but they also can bring a lot of problems, especially for people that are tasked with making sure they're online, performing, and doing what they should be. Um, so promise to get in containers a little bit, so I'm gonna, gonna go on from there. Um, so who's heard of like containers and containerization and Linux and stuff, right? So maybe that's, yeah, Linux and stuff. Great, everybody. Um, um, yeah, so uh, I, I like, so we talk about um, containers a bunch and, um, but it took me like two years or I don't know, something. And then I realized like, oh, that's what you mean by containers? And so I partly what I want to share with you guys is like containers are kind of no big deal. It's what you can do with containers. So I want to talk a little bit, um, pretty straight up, about containers and what they are and dispel any myths or like everybody should hopefully leave the room knowing what containers are or having a better idea. So um, containers, like, yeah, it's a buzzword, right? It gets thrown around. It's kind of like NoSQL, right? Like a couple of years ago and everything's NoSQL. And then someone like redefines NoSQL as not only SQL and that is kind of, you know, even more confusing. And so to me, containers are like right, like right in that buzzword um, territory of meaning something very specific, uh, meaning something between a very specific thing and kind of nothing at all. Um, so for example, it, um, at Pantheon, this is what our marketers say we built. So this is on our How It Works page. And this is all factually correct. But at the bottom, you'll see something that looks like a cross between like a nano cat and um, and kind of a squid. And then up top, up, up top, I think what's going on there is that um, some HTTP requests are trying to inseminate a runtime matrix. <laughs> and we might have twins. I don't really know. There's a cache hit involved. So um, so right, like this stuff doesn't really help like dispel any myths about containers. This probably actually makes it worse, um, uh, but on, but you know, kind of when you zoom up to ten thousand feet, everything kind of you know, it's a little hard to see what's going on. So, um, in a, in a, there'll be lots of stuff like this out there, but also hopefully more um, kind of hands-on stuff that gives a better people a better idea what's going on. Um, so containers are very simply just resource constrained, system isolated, metered processes. I could even just say they're just processes. When people are confused about containers, I was looking at these water bottle containers, right? And like, nobody wonders like what a water bottle container is. Like, it's just a piece of thin plastic that holds stuff, right? And the only difference is before you had plastic water bottles, you were all wet when you tried to carry your drink somewhere. 
And that's basically what's going on here. Containers are like very obvious. It's what they enable you to do, carry your water, your Gatorade with you around. So basically they're just processes with some constraints on them and, uh, and isolated. Um, one cool thing about containers, so this is some code we'll get into in a little bit, but um, is that they're really fast to spin up, like a couple of milliseconds. So in a lot of ways, if you're asking, which is a common question, how are containers different from VMs? Well, they're not really all that different, except that one takes a few milliseconds, maybe seconds, something to spin up. The other might take, I don't know, minutes, right? So it's not that it's totally different, it's just that it's happening a thousand times faster, right? And that enables some cool use cases that um, even, uh, you know, that kind of VMs um, don't work uh, quite so well on. Some of those use cases are, um, <laughs> you know, very applicable, kind of, people are doing kind of cutting edge stuff, and I think, um, but in general, um, just the speed of containers versus VMs is something uh, that, will, that will enable a lot of great stuff we'll see in the years to come. So, so yeah, some people, um, even if you, you know, I just run this one server, this like, I forget what this one is, Mac 2, E, Mac 3? Macintosh. Macintosh, oh, the first Macintosh. Uh, and, you know, you should probably upgrade your hardware because Drupal's not really going to scream on this thing. But even if you just say you have one server, you, I, I'd be willing to bet that you actually have more. I'm willing to bet that you have like a laptop that you work on, maybe a desktop, something like that, and then you have this one server in the cloud. So even if you think you have one like kind of production server or something, um, maybe and even if you're just one, you know, freelancer, I'm willing to bet you actually have two servers and this, these portability wins are going to be, uh, are going to be good for you as much as someone with a big scale thing. Um, so like, oh, uh, some other cool stuff that containers enable. Um, so OS upgrades suck, right? When you have to um, kind of upgrade the kernel for security reasons, you know, you don't want to delay this stuff, you need to do it, but it's kind of a little scary to do on a running server, you're not really sure what's gonna happen, a lot of packages, different stuff, so. Um, uh, oh yeah, cloud VMs kind of get weird sometimes, like, you know, you can't really, you don't have too much visibility into what's going on, so you're like, ah, maybe I just want to ditch that thing entirely. So when you're kind of operating with containers, you have a nice la layer of abstraction between the server and between um, the container that's actually running your Drupal site or um, PHP processor or whatever it is. And so you can just migrate those containers on the application layer um, to, uh, to another server, and then you can just kill the old server um, and so this is one technique for not even dealing with in-place server upgrades. You just spin up new servers that have the new kernel, have the new uh, OS distribution, whatever, migrate containers there, and kill the old ones. So in this case, this is kind of a graph of after, after doing kind of wholesale migrations and new servers and, and, and deletions, kind of the average age of servers kind of drops. So they're nice and, n nice and fresh and um, uh, didn't have to deal with upgrading any of the old ones in place. Um, so I've, like... Had experience doing this with Fedora 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and now we're on 20. So we, we, I love this little logo here the, with the mustard is, um, I think his name is Beefy Miracle and he's the Fedora logo, uh, or like the Fedora mascot maybe. Um, but he says, end of life is a way of life. And Fedora has one of the shortest timelines of any server and it kind of forces you to think through this stuff uh, and embrace, you know, embrace the portability and see what, see what we can make happen from it. So another uh, little anecdote is kind of like, um, you know, so the kind of MySQL was growing up and got, kind of got bought by Sun and then got bought by Oracle and then, you know, there's this like new fork and nobody knows going on for a bit and then sometimes someone's kind of like, ah, oh, yeah, MariaDB is pretty cool, uh, let's roll with it. So it, uh, with the, um, using containers, it's also, um, and, and focusing on this portability and architecting for this portability makes it really easy to um, do stuff like migrate thousands of MySQL servers over to a new box and, uh, and turn them um, uh, onto MariaDB containers. So that was pretty cool. And I love the new yak and that he's roasting that dolphin um, and the, the MySQL logo. Cool. That was easy. So that's what that's what I that's, that's some things that con containers able enable to too, especially if you're thinking about the portability. Um, so now we're gonna kind of really this is where like we roll up um, our sleeves um, a little bit, and uh, we're gonna I, probably you got some people probably know this really well, but uh, it's kind of weird and cool. So we'll go into it a little bit. But proc file system, look about C groups, talk about kernel namespaces. 
So on a technical level, containers are based, um, in the Linux world, containers are based on um, uh, C groups and namespaces uh, to pieces of functionality in the Linux kernel. So these are, um, so we're gonna go into each of these a little bit. C groups, look at how much fun these people are having with C groups. Um, everybody looks like they're having a pretty good time. Um, and C groups is another one that's really simple to think about. It's just a way of uh, categorizing uh, processes. So maybe one reasonable way would be to like have this root where you're like, okay, all processes, um, and then on the, maybe I'll set this aside into my production processes and maybe my development processes, and down there you have the actual stuff you might be running, PHP, FPM, Drush, rsync, stuff like that. Maybe you wanna kind of wait these a little bit, we'll get into that. And then like a slightly less reasonable, more kind of bastard operator from hell thing would be like, okay, processes for people I like, yeah, they get all the juice, of course, and then processes for the people I don't like not getting very much juice. But really, it's just, and you can make these, C groups lets you make these um, hierarchies as arbitrarily complex or deep or wide or like tailored to your use case uh, as, as you want. But really, there's some um, uh, kind of pretty easy kind of in industry best um, standards that I'll talk about a little bit going forward. So a lot of people associate C, group, C groups with resource control, right? But really, C groups is just a way to categorize stuff. But then there are these C groups submodules and controllers. Oh yeah, so C groups, I have no idea what the capitalization is. And it's, it's short for control groups, but it's kind of one of those things that's hard to Google for because, well, the capitalization is just all over the place and no one really calls it control groups. And I think Google, at least now, like knows, um, doesn't try to autocorrect you when you say C groups. But um, So there are these submodules, right? For memory, maybe you want to limit the memory for one of those groups of processes that you defined earlier. Maybe you want to pick the CPUs. If you have like a quad core, maybe you want one core for dev and the other uh, three for production or something like that. You want to keep better accounting of what's going on there. Um, maybe you want... Uh, um, some devices, physical devices, to be accessible to, um, uh, to uh, this set of processes, not these processes. Limit the block I.O., the kind of reading and writing you're doing from disk, stuff like that. Tag network packets based on which process they're coming from, that sort of things. So th even though this isn't core to C groups, this is really generally what people are talking about when they say C groups. Um, is kind of this actual physical resource, CPU, memory, block I.O., that kind of thing, that, that kind of, um, those kind of constraints. Um, so, um, again, Linux and back to Linux and stuff. So there are these two kind of virtual file systems, proc and like sysfs. So people know, people have seen this kind of before, right? So these are, these are some kind of, uh, funny things. They're, they look like a file system. They act like a file system. Um, but they're actually not really a file system in the way we commonly think of file systems. Really, they're a way for interacting with the kernel. So in Linux, we have the kernel, and then we have user space, which is everything outside the kernel. Um, and um, so these file systems, which you can see on any Linux server, look like a file system, but they're actually a way of interacting with the kernel. Um, and I'm not really sure why this happened. I, my theory, or I was talking about it earlier, and I think someone, um, someone called it a philosophy, but I think it probably just happened because Someone's like, how are we going to interact with the kernel? And someone else who probably wrote file systems was like, let's make a file, virtual file system. I think this might even work. Um, but so stuff like configuring kind of your, um, your uh, the, how the kernel um, uh, manages IP forwarding or something like that. This thing looks like a file, uh, but actually write, reading and writing to it is not merely writing to a file on disk. It's actually interacting with the kernel and telling it to change the way that it's uh, managing the network in this case. So this is kind of a cool like proc file system hack. I don't know um, uh, if you guys have seen it, but so um, say we're running Nginx, right? Uh, web server, right? It is access log, stuff like that. So if we look in the proc, direc proc directory under the Nginx uh, process ID uh, and in this FD for file descriptors um, directory, we might see you know a, a handful of file descriptors, right? One might be to dev null for doing, you know, black holing some data. One might be a socket that Nginx is listening on or something like that. And one might be an, to an actual real file like the access log, right? So you can RM, RF that access log 
and you don't see it in your shell anymore, right? If you ls, that access log, log is gone. Um, but uh, uh, according, like, as far as that process knows and the kernel knows, that process is still holding on to that descriptor for that file and still writing to it. So even after you RMRF this, this file, you can kind of, through the proc file system, go in and actually tail it and read it and interact with it. So sometimes this can get, this can get you out of a jam um, if, you, uh, if you accidentally remove something that's still being held on to some process. But all this is to say proc, sysfs are not, uh, not your normal file system stuff. And we're going into this because cgroups relies on both of these file systems to interact with the kernel. So back to cgroups. We'll do something nice and easy to start. We'll uh, make a new C group uh, um, kind of under the memory tree and call it AA, um, uh, which is pretty uninspired, but it makes it easy to fit on the slides. So we go in, right, everyone can rock this on the command line, make dir, you know, create a directory, sys, fs, C groups, memory, AA. And now if we list that right after making it, magically there are all these other files in there cgroup.clonechildren, memory.kmem.usageandbytes, memory, uh oh, it wrapped, memory.limits and bytes, and stuff like that. So, what we did there, it looked like we were making a directory, but we were really interacting with the kernel and telling it to create a new cgroup called AA. So, now, just like we kind of did for managing the network earlier, we're just going to echo 100 and put, um, put that into. Um, the file called mem uh, memory.limitInBytes in, um, in this AAC group. So that's pretty easy. We already made a C group, and now we're kind of you know, setting some uh, constraints on physical resources on memory just with like a couple lines of bash that anyone could, could rock. Um, so that's like a little, that's cool, but it's a little weird, right? So maybe, maybe we want to like use some tools that are a little higher level, right? Because uh, that, that feels a little, always feels a little dangerous and weird to me. So um, libcgroups uh, is a library for interacting with cgroups with the kernel, and it comes with a couple tools, uh, a couple helper tools. So um, we'll kind of do that same thing we just did. We'll just create, except for the CPU this time, we'll create the CPU AA uh, cgroups, uh, cgroup, um, and then we'll set the CPU.shares value to 100. Sounds, seems nice and arbitrary, we'll rock it. Um, and then we'll use uh, CG exec to, uh, to run this little Python script uh, um, while telling the Python, uh, the Python script to run in the, in the C group AA that we just made. Um, so I have a, a bunch of cool examples online on GitHub. So we can get, we, I don't think we'll have time today, but we'll, we can get those together. And they're just kind of fun ways to like play around with C groups. So I thought this was kind of a funny way. So we'll create a memory, a C group called Teensy in memory. And then we'll use CG set and set the limit in bytes to um, 100 bytes for the Teensy process. And then this is a little, a little command line magic, but right, you're getting the dollar sign, dollar sign is getting the process ID of the current, uh, the current process, which is this bash shell that we're presumably in. And we'll, um, again, use just this kind of like redirection to associate, um, to write that process file to this tasks file. Um, and thereby associating the current shell we're in with the teensy memory thing. So what can you do with 100 bytes of memory? Mm, pretty much nothing. So at this point, we've, we've locked down the shell we're working in to 100 bytes of memory, and if you try to run anything, it will kill your shell. So that's nice and fun because your shell dies and then you have to make a, a new one, but you kind of get the point. Um, uh, that, the, that the C group memory limit kind of uh, uh, was acting upon your shell. Um, so CPU shares, right? CPU shares is just a way for kind of prioritizing um, uh, CPU resources. So maybe we make one CPU C group called AA. We, we tell it that its shares are 100 and another one that its shares are 10. And we kind of run a CPU intensive thing um, and uh, kind of if, if you look at top, you'll see that one is using roughly 10x what the other is. Um, and in this, the limit in bytes is, you know, limit in bytes uh, actually has units. CPU shares is different, that it's just kind of, um, uh, that it's just um, relative. So these could be one and 10 or uh, 
10 and 100 or 3 and 30, and you'd get the kind of same output here. So as I mentioned, additional uh, C groups, kernel namespaces are the other critical part of containers. So while con uh, C groups are categorizing and, 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 and have these submodules for limiting the physical resources, kernel namespaces are, are ways of, in software, isolating um, some processes for the other. So um, um, for example, IPC, inter-process communication, if you really want secure isolation, you don't want one process to be able to kind of chat with the other process. So you can use this IPC uh, namespace to I isolate them. Um, network namespace, if you have, again, two processes that you want to kind of run on the same server, but you don't really want them to talk together, you can use a network namespace. Um, and that will essentially, as far as the kernel is concerned, as far as the process is, con is concerned, launch those on two totally separate different networks. Um, and there's another, a number of others here, the mount, um, PID, user, UTS, but that's, that's the basic gist of it. So as um, ShareBear, ShareBear looks pretty cute, but, um, but he's kind of a badass. And one time he said, um, you know, before you can share, you must first unshare, which I thought was pretty deep. Uh, unshare is a uh, system call, and it's also a utility that you can run. Um, and so this is just a, a, an example here. Unshare, um, uh, so what unshare is doing is it's unsharing it from the, from the rest of the processes. It is creating a namespace for whatever you run after it. So we're unsharing, and we're saying specifically create a network namespace for bin bash. And so if you just run this command, you will be in a bash shell which cannot talk with any other network at that point. Um, and so that's kind of the simplest way to create a network namespace um, uh, um, for a process. Um, so great, I'm glad we kind of got in there and dirty and now we can kind of all totally forget that knowledge because um, uh, unless you want to explore and uh, that kind of thing, um, I certainly don't really want to be managing kind of Drupal, like back to Drupal world and, and awesome sites world. That's kind of way too low, low level for the day to day. Um, but I wanted to show you guys a little bit about what's going on kind of, um, uh, you know, lo lower level on, on, the, on the Linux side, Chrome side. Well, there's got to be a better way to do this, right? There's got to be a better way to get the portability, the, the, the gains we want without really worrying about this stuff on a low level. Um, and so um, kind of moving up the chain from some of the, the work we just did, we looked at kind of using the virtual file systems and then we kind of looked at some helper tools that were out there. And this is kind of going up the stack a whole other layer. So um, there's stuff uh, like Docker, which probably everyone's heard of, OpenVZ, um, Libvirt, uh, Libvirt LXC. Um, let me containerize that for you. Is this thing from Google I'll talk about? And, um, and then just a generic container with the Linux Penguin on it. Um, I think, like, probably ever, who's heard of Docker? Probably, yeah. Um, so Docker's awesome, and I think it's pretty easy to tell, like, which one of these are going to be, like, are well-marketed because they have logos. So a lot of this stuff, like, the slides aren't very pretty because, like, no one, um, a lot of kernel hackers, not many logo designers, um, uh, which, which um, I guess is a fact of the world that, that um, helps, helps projects uh, get out there and get well-known. Um, so this is on GitHub. Um, this kind of goes, you know, goes through kind of comparing some of these different tools that let you manage this stuff. So Docker is in there. Um, another one called System D, System D Nspawn, um, LXC, Libvirt LXC, uh, LMCTFY, which is LemCutFi, which is let me containerize that for you or contain that for you, which is Google's, and OpenVZ. So all of these are a little different, right? They're probably coming from different places, like different. Um, uh, they might be just pure open source. They might be kind of uh, spurred uh, out development at a single organization um, or uh, like kind of pure open source, like systemd is kind of from the ground up, like um, created. Uh, but basically they have kind of some different um, things. And these might, um, like socket activation is kind of a cool one where um, you can have a container that's using no resources and as soon as someone kind of wants to interact with that container, um, maybe over a, uh, um, network socket or something like that, it'll just spin up into existence and let you use it. Um, 
and uh, kind of some other details here. So this is a cool GitHub repo that's kind of a community moderated matrix of kind of which one of these, uh, which one of these supports different, um, different uh, features. Um, so LXC, there is no logo. Um, LXC is, um, is a wrapper around uh, the things we were just talking about, C groups and namespaces. It is part of, uh, um, uh, well, libLXC is kind of a wrapper around those things. It has binding so you can use it from different languages, um, a set of tools, decent docs on this, um, as well as container templates. Um, I'll save my recommendation for the end, which is gonna be Docker, but I still wanna kind of go through this stuff. Um, <laughs> I don't wanna spoil it. So Lemcutfee definitely wins, the, like they don't have a logo, but like, like anything with Google, you can probably get something with like these colored blocks. Um, so that counts for something, although it's not a real logo. And let me contain that for you. It's like a pretty good name. I'm not sure who came up with it or who let them come with, up with it. But Lem Cutfi is, is a little is kind of fun to say um, as well. So it's created by Google. It's kind of open source. Um, I was hoping to get it to to build on the on the demo vagary box I have, but it's a little bit of a pain to build. Um, and it's really cool. Google's like putting resources into open sourcing it, but I think it's not. But um, but uh, they might have a hard time getting a, getting adoption because it is kind of has one foot firmly in, inside their uh, firewall. Um, but every single process at Google runs in a Lemcutfi container, right? So that's pretty cool. Google, data centers full of servers, servers churning away, right? Every single one of them is using Lemcutfi to containerize it. Um, and and um, largely what this is doing at Google is trying to achieve 100% util utilization. So you have jobs queued up like indefinitely, and as soon as a server has a, a little bit of resources, it'll start working on a slow job. It can get killed if like a new, if someone types in, you know, Linux containers in Google and presses enter, and that server needs to be used to serve that real-time request. And that's all done through namespaces and stuff. It is nested containers, which is kind of cool. So a lot of the C groups and namespaces is about um, uh, isolating the process, but some of it is, um, is just for the process's sake. Like, uh, so the PID namespace, if you put something in the process uh, identifier namespace, it will think that it's the only process running on the box. And I like to think that that is like more for that process than the other processes, and it just makes it feel good. Like, ah, oh, this whole server, and I'm just gonna do what I do. Um, uh, but, so there, that's Lem um middle of the road logo. So systemd nspawn, nspawn is, uh, is also a cool name, and I might be giving away some of my criteria for, for evaluating these things, <laughs> but there's also not a logo. Um, it comes out of the systemd project. Who knows about systemd? Yeah, some people. Uh, so systemd is shipping with Fedora. It's gonna get cut onto RHEL. Um, Shuttleworth uh, acknowledged it'll be part of Ubuntu coming up. Um, and systemd basically replaces sys5 init. Uh, this, I don't know if that means anything, but instead of kind of init scripts and PID files, systemd is a, a process manager that runs as the first process when your Linux server boots. It helps you keep track of all this stuff, all these processes, C groups, stuff like that. It also has this systemd nspawn thing um, for uh, creating kind of real, real containers. Um, um, Oh, so this is going to ship with like Fedora and RHEL and stuff, and it will ship even if you guys don't know about it. Uh, and my colleague Joe Miller gave a cool talk at sent to us Dojo, kind of um, uh, about kind of living in the living in the future because we've been on Fedora and System D for a while. Um, but it's definitely something to kind of look into because it, it, uh, it might, you know it's a little different than um, init scripts and stuff like that, and we'll see more and more of it for sure. So this is like one, one of the little demos, but. I, <laughs> So I was like playing with Vagrant in a Fedora box. I'm like, okay, launch Vagrant, that's cool. Virtual box, right, OS X, virtual box, Fedora thing. I'm like, okay, dbootstrap is just, it's a Debian command that gives you like a very minimal Debian install, right? And then you're like, systemd, nspawn, that Debian box. And so I'm playing around with this, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm on OS X, and I have a Fedora VM with virtual box, and then I, I, I made a container and it's just, no, that's not enough. We have to go deeper. We have to do more, more levels. Um, and, uh, 
And then I actually just stopped and kept, just went to bed or something. But pretty cool, right? You can, you can kind of, uh, that's what containers do. They just let you go kind of deeper and deeper um, in those processes. You might think that they're the only ones running on the box. Um, no, this is like just a little cool tidbit, pretty much the same thing, but you can be like dash dash read only, and then nobody can write to that file system. I don't know, for some reason, launching a whole container that can't write just kind of gets my, um, I'm like, huh, I wonder what I could do with, with that. Um, nobody could write anything. They couldn't break anything. Uh, <laughs> um, sure, you can't use it, but it will never break. Um, and then Docker. So a lot of you heard about Docker. Um, it came out of a company called DotCloud, and I kind of liked this. Um, I kind of liked this quote, and I thought it was a little apropos of the talk. Um, Docker talking about in its early age, DotCloud, the DotCloud pl platform used plain LXC, which we discussed, has no logo. Uh, the platform evolved. They were like patching the kernel, kind of doing this different stuff, and then eventually they're like, "Whoa, this is like not. This is really different than LXC. This is totally different. Um, let's." get an awesome logo and tell everyone about this. Um, I, uh, there are a lot of people probably in this room that know more, more about Docker and Drupal and how this can make you know, your, um, your developers happy and your life happy and stuff. And I think check out um, Ricardo Amaro's talk from DrupalCon Prague. I thought that was a pretty awesome one. Pretty good over, overlap with this talk, but specifically some cool Docker stuff. So that's a good place to get started and um, ask around. Maybe we could boff or something because I'm sure some people have been playing around. Um, and doc, I mean, so DocCloud made Docker. Um, they started with this kind of platform as a service, which may or may not still be around, but now realize that, oh my gosh, people don't really need the platform. They just need this, this wrapper around all these things so they're not using proc and sysfs to do this cool stuff. They can start, keep working on the important things. Um, so right, there's a spectrum, right? We started off virtual file systems Lem Cutfee is kind of weird. LXC is still pretty low level. Doesn't feel super helpful when you use it. End spawn, you know, it got me to that inception kind of, you know, um, uh, idea. But then, you know, and I think Docker is probably again one of the best marketed, best propel, prepared, best documented kind of like highest momentum um, ways that you can actually leverage this in your day to day. Um, whether you're a developer, right, or a uh, or a um, operator, or systems administrator, or um, you know a small shop or a big shop, or working in open source or on private stuff, so um, pretty exciting stuff. Um, and then just to set up a talk for like uh, next DrupalCon, um, uh, once you get a bunch of containers running on a server, you need to manage those containers across you know, multiple servers, right, for HA or even data centers or whatever. And there's this cool project, CoreOS, um, that is kind of, um, I think they have a product now, but they don't, it's not really a product you can use. I think they're really setting their sights maybe 18 months down the road when, um, when uh, everyone's like, yeah, Docker, no sweat, right? And uh, now how do I use Docker on like, you know, 100 machines at once? Um, uh, but that's cool. And, and I have good hopes for their success because of their logo. <laughs> Um, and, 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 and yeah, because of their logo. Um, that's a cool one to check out. So, uh, no, uh, you know what Alf says? <laughs> no problem. Uh, you know, no servers, no problems. No problem, says Alf. So, you know, servers are great. They solve problems. They power the internet. They also create problems. Uh, containers really can kind of get this kind of agile portability, whether you're working, you know, with a few servers or many servers or a few sites or... Um, Many sites, small teams, big teams, a lot of cool stuff going on there. Um, don't worry about containers. You already know what they are, and you can tell everyone you know exactly what they are. Um, they're just isolated processes, and uh, on the, on the um, technical level, they're implemented with C groups and namespaces. Um, and, uh, you know, please, please <laughs> use an awesome tool to manage this stuff. Otherwise, you're probably, you know, just going to be typing on the command line. A little too much. Um, and the future is now. I think this stuff is really happening, and I would encourage everyone and be excited to chat with everyone about kind of what opportunities this kind of stuff opens up and, um, and uh, where it's going to go next and, and, all, and kind of how you can leverage it, you know, to make your life better because technology just isn't about technology. It's about how to make our lives better, and, and I think uh, these technologies can do that. So let's go out there. Let's make some more Drupal. Let's keep some sites online. Um, and uh, 
uh, yeah, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, um, we have a, a few minutes for Q&A if we want, or happy to kind of just like get together after or um, online or whatever. You, I put on, some, on GitHub some of these like container demos. Um, if you just want kind of like the easiest way to um, play around with some of this, like that always helps me. <laughs> um, you know, hacking on the command line always helps me kind of get my head around a little bit. Not sure if it will you. Um, and finishing up with a calming manatee here um, uh, might mark the um, yeah end of the end of the sessions at uh, DrupalCon. So thank you guys so much. Any questions? What up? So I'm guessing that you guys are probably using systemd and nspawn at Pantheon? Uh, we use it a little bit. Prim like, primarily, um, systemd has other ways of letting you interact with uh, C groups and namespaces that aren't um, through nspawn, just through like, kind of the unit configuration directives. And so that, that's kind of an even lighter way of, uh, of managing those uh, C groups and namespaces. OK, and what's nspawn's role there? Um, so nspawn um, is basically a, a, like um, a wrapper that kind of helps you actually kind of mimic kind of like a boot as opposed to just just creating a process. Um, so nspawn like helps you create like a whole like it looks like I have a whole server to myself as opposed to like I'm just a process I'm just a process and I have this much memory and this much um, you know CPU or whatever. And I'm guessing that you guys need some of that stuff. Um, for what you're doing? I, I guess, sorry, this is sort of segueing into a question about whether if you were starting today, whether you'd yeah. probably build on Docker or whether you'd sort of I, stick with the system. If, I mean, stuff. if you were doing, if, um, if you wanted to build a big platform, which like people, uh, there's going to be amazing innovation in this space and I would, you, I would look straight to CoreOS because these guys are rethinking um, like from the operating system level up uh, how this stuff works. So CoreOS all the way and I, and, um, but it's not quite there yet. And then if I was a developer or a, a, a operator, I would look largely to, to Docker right here now. Thanks. Yeah. All right, everyone. Um, hope to, oh, I, well, uh, yeah. So I was just gonna ask, because uh, more servers, more problems, but you do need servers, because yes. you need at least one. <laughs> um, yes. So what kind of goes into this decision on whether to Containerize something or spin up a new VM yeah. for it. So, like, if I could make a million dollars running one line of code on a Raspberry Pi, I would have already done that. <laughs> but I can't, and I need to use servers to to, to like power the the, I, the experiences and, and solutions I'm I'm helping people get to. Um, the cool thing about containerization is once you're thinking once you're thinking about the water bottle, uh, it doesn't matter if you have a whole like say you have. Um, Two servers, right? Whatever, two big beefy servers. Um, once you're thinking about the water bottle, it doesn't really matter if you have one water bottle on that server or many. Uh, this, this is um, so. I, I, yeah, I think it's it's all about architecting for the portability. And, and once you like have the idea of containers and that, that you, they're portable and you can kind of move them around more easily, then that's really kind of where you want to get to. Because then it doesn't really matter. Um, what physical, it's an abstraction later, abstraction, abstracting what you're running from where it's running. So at that point it just becomes a resource allocation type thing. Right, More, you know, like what, you know, what servers do I have available and what kind of processing needs do I have and how can I kind of allocate those? Which is the whole Lem Cut fee idea yeah, and, reason. And okay. like specifically Lem Cut fee has like this pretty cool containerization thing, but what they don't do, what they don't open source is that like resource allocation thing, which is like the, the big, the big uh, algorithmic kind of challenge there. It's their, it's their money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks. I started walking out and I really, I might have missed a very basic thing here. So like what part of the stack are we containerizing? I mean, you, are you saying, you know, like for each website, run Apache and Drupal in its own container, as opposed to having multiple ones running together. 
Yeah. Uh, how far, you know, how, what would you couple in there and decouple? Would you, would you put, uh, <clears throat> like, you know, would you put Redis in there too, or yeah. would you have that somewhere totally. else? I mean, um, elaborate on that a little bit, please. Um, so um, as far as the technical constraints, you can kind of do whatever you want, right? In terms of um, what uh, I guess my experience is with is um, containerizing each resource. Um, so Redis is its in its own kind of C group container, and PHP is in its own C group container, uh, PHP FPM. Um, well, actually, so that's a, that, that's a good point. Redis is in its own container because you really just need one process to run it. For, um, for application containers, we pair um, Nginx and um, uh, PHPFPM in the same container. So in that case, because those are kind of intimately tied, um, we'll, we'll use the same um, containerization there. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, generally you just, you can think of like, um, okay, I want to run these two things. Do I want thing A to impact thing B, or do like, or do I not want them to impact each other? And if you don't want them to impact each other, um, it, it's a case for uh, containerizing them separately. Good question, though, and I, I think that's um, that's another kind of open question. There are different ways to do it, right? You could containerize a whole Drupal stack in kind of one, you know, one um, like server. What we do is more kind of at Pantheon is more like. Um, more spread out, so we'll have, and this is just kind of our decision that doesn't, it's just kind of how we did it. It's like, we'll have servers that have all application um, containers on it, and then servers that have all database servers on it, and then servers that have all Redis servers on it, or Redis uh, containers, sorry. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And I think Docker has some kind of notions of how that, they're gonna want that to work for you, and those are probably good, good places to start for sure. So I noticed that you did a, a de-bootstrap on a directory when, before you started a container. Um, so when you're trying to reduce the number of servers you've got, doesn't it actually lead to you having more servers because you now got to maintain and upgrade all those individual de-bootstrapped environments? Um, yeah, that's a good point. So I think in, in some ways, um, definitely, like the com if, if um, depending on your containerization strategy, that you can get that complexity. Um, uh, like you have as many like Linux like operating system like things, right? Um, but uh, largely, um, you know, if you go back to the network example, um, th there are physical network things that can fail. Um, whereas, in the reliability of that is probably considerably lower than the reliability of like a loopback interface that you're configuring on the host. So in that case. Um, Although you are not completely reducing the complexity of um, kind of operating system like stuff, um, you are kind of choosing for a, a higher reliability um, uh, kind of, in that case, network over, over another. You are talking about uh, servers, but does this containerization work in virtual machines? <clears throat> yeah. In, in, well, for example, instead of buying servers, I would choose uh, Amazon Web Services and just buy a couple of virtual machines or yeah. buy from Rackspace. Totally. Yeah. So, like, Pantheon largely runs on uh, Rackspace Cloud VMs and um, also some hardware and other stuff. And that's like the cool thing, kind of, with this example, like, of System D Unspawn, where I have like OSX and then Fedora and then this other stuff that. Um, uh, kind of, by definition, containers kind of don't really care what they're running on, and um, um, you can, yeah, you can, you can do it on a, on a VM just as easily. The, w one technical difference between a VM and a, and a container is that um, in the VM, you can actually run different kernels, because you're emulating the, um, uh, the processor, but, um, but in containers, uh, you're, you have to use whatever kernel the host kernel is using because you literally are using the host, unit's, uh, the host kernel to manage the processes. So the previous question brought up a question for me. You know, there's still configuration management with all this stuff. Like with the example that we were talking about earlier with two questions ago with, you know, let's say we have a you know, a Drupal stack, Nginx, and FPM that uh, right. is also dependent upon uh, Redis. So 
somewhere that container needs to know uh, where to go to get its Redis objects from. Stuff. Yeah, totally. Um, and basically, how, how do you manage all that? Yeah, so that, that's a great question, and I think that's kind of what I was alluding to with the core OS, um, which is, and again, starting kind of with the virtual file system. Um, um, like, we, we use Chef, we use a lot of Chef at Pantheon, right? That's like, that configuration management is critical. Um, especially kind of the, if you're on one of the lower, if you're on the lower end of the um, kind of spectrum, um, here, you're going to be probably doing more like hands-on configuration management. Um, if you're on the higher end, you're probably doing a little less. Um, and so I think that's where, um, uh, to my knowledge, stuff like Docker and then CoreOS are trying like basically make it so you have to do a lot less of like the nitty gritty kind of like make or set permissions, like touch this file kind of stuff. Um, but depending on where you are in the spectrum, you definitely need configuration management. I imagine a little less so down the road. Um, and then the other thing you got at is, I mean, you can, it can fall under configuration management. It can also fall under orchestration, which is even if that Redis thing is perfectly configured and you're good to go, until the, until the PHP you know, knows about that, it's not gonna be able to use it. So that's kind of another piece, which is kind of, and depending on your architecture, a different problem, but um, notifying, you know, after you provision and it's ready to go, notifying the PHP that, hey, here's this other resource you can connect to. Do you, do you yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, do you know off the top of your head of uh, any interaction between or, or modules in Ansible that work with these containers? Um, I, I do not. Um, I, think there's, I think that's um, something um, definitely worth looking into. Um, and, it, and like, depending on what you're using Ansible with, if you're using it with System D, which you totally can, um, uh, then you can kind of pair those up pretty well. So I think we'll do the last yeah. question here. Yeah, real quick, speaking of the Raspberry Pi, if, if you have a 32-bit kernel, is there any way of emulating a 64-bit uh, um, using a container? Yeah. I know you can do it the other way around. Oh, the other way around. Yeah. I, I don't know. That's not really something um, that's been on my radar, but um, yeah, it might just be like a down down downsampling kind of thing. Well, if anyone wants to boff about it, I'm, cool. I'm intrigued. But thank you very much. Okay, last, last. <laughs> Hi. Uh, it, it could be possible to dynamically assign resources to Docker, for example, uh, triggered by a uh, mm, uh, number of hits uh, yeah. for a website without shut down the, the container and yeah, so I was just, I have some resources on like the GitHub thing and, and like Google's kind of a great source for this because they like are definitely doing it at scale. And I think, um, I can't quite remember, but something like one writes a second to C groups and 10 reads a second is what they, what they were kind of, uh, you know, uh, saying was happening on their servers. So as much as once a second, you know, you could be kind of reallocating um, CPU shares or something. I think that probably also depends on just the um, hierarchy you set up, like how um, how dynamic you'd want to be changing those. Our use case at Pantheon doesn't really require very dynamic um, uh, reshaping of the C groups. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>